I'd like to entitle my message this morning, God, I just don't understand. God, I just don't understand. I don't know about you, but there are many things I just could not understand. For example, I could not understand why many of you are blessed with double eyelids and I don't have. <laughs> I just don't understand. I've been married to my wife, Carries, for 38 years. But from time to time, I still could not understand her. I just could not understand. But on a more serious note, I could not understand why God would allow a dear pastor, a wonderful husband, and also a father to die from COVID. I just could not comprehend. A good pastor, a senior pastor of a thriving church. But COVID took his life away. I couldn't understand why a young woman with a bright future, but her life was shortened because of cancer. I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand why a loving young couple, after being blessed by a baby, but in a few days' time, the baby passed away. I could not understand. Church, the list could go on. And I'm sure you also have faced with situations in your life that you could not understand. From time to time, we face with certain situations where we could not fully understand and situations that just don't make sense at all. So the question is, what do we do when we don't understand? What do we do when we struggle with such issues that confront us from time to time? Of course, we ask why. God, why? How come? We have lots of questions in our mind, right? And of course, at times, we, 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 we get very upset, even angry uh, with God. God, how could you allow such thing to happen in my life, in my family? We question the goodness of God. And sometimes we also doubt. Do you ever doubt Right from time to time, we all do doubt because of certain situations that we face. And as I mentioned, we all do doubt. And uh, Martin Luther once said, only God and some madmen don't doubt. But doubt has a way of affecting us, especially when it is not sincere doubts, but you know, sarcastic doubts or skeptical, skeptical doubts especially. Doubts have a way of affecting us because they can bring discouragement to us, despair, we feel down, and even disillusionment, dejection, and also deconstruction. Deconstruction is a term that's been used commonly now in the evangelical, in the evangelical world. Deconstruction comes from the word deconstruct or the word de dismantle. It's about a believer who comes to a point where that person dismantle his faith. The person dismantle his faith and ultimately also departs from the faith because of certain situations that took place in their lives. They got so upset, they doubt God, and they decided to depart from the faith. I know of such people. And in these days and time, even some famous people have departed from their faith. So the question is, what matters when we don't understand. In the midst of such struggle, 
what is important. So this morning, I'd like to highlight three things that really matter when we don't understand. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You remember the last time when I was here, I also asked you to turn to Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 when I talk about God and His guidance. But this morning, once again, let's look at these two powerful verses. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. What matters when we don't understand? First, faith matters. Faith matters. Trust in the Lord. We are called to trust in the Lord with all our hearts at all times. That means during good times and bad times, our faith must be strongly anger upon the Lord. We are to trust Him. But having said that, you will agree with me that it is easy to trust the Lord when the going is fine, right? When you move into your dream house, when you get your promotion, when your portfolio is up, when your children is, you know, uh, get into their chosen school. Wow, we praise the Lord. It is easy to trust the Lord when the going is well. But what about when the going is tough? When you face with big mountains in your life, when your world falls apart, when sorrow buffers you like a storm, when you feel that like your life is at the end of the rope, do you still trust the Lord? Is your faith still strongly anchored upon the Lord when the going is tough? Church, we need to understand there are two sides to faith. One I call the expectant faith. The other I call the enduring faith. First, expectant faith. Expectant faith is about a faith that is strong, believe in God, you know, for breakthroughs, uh, the impossibilities, God can work it out and bring about possibilities. We believe in healing and deliverance and whatnot. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We expect God to move and do great things in our lives. That is an important element of faith, expectant faith. But there's also the enduring faith. That means faith in God, even when you don't understand. When the situation doesn't make sense, or when God is silenced in your life, your faith continues to endure and still anger upon the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is enduring faith. Even when your prayers are not answered, you still say, God, I still trust in you. Expectant faith and enduring faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. You know that chapter? It's about the heroes of faith. People who put their faith in God no matter what. In Hebrews chapter 11, you see men and women having expectant faith, but you also see men and women having enduring faith because many of them, they die in the faith without experiencing the promises of God. They die in the faith without realizing or experiencing the promises of God. Church, faith is believing when I don't see it. Obeying when I don't understand it. Giving when I don't have all of it. Persisting when I don't feel like it. And trusting when I don't get it. That is faith. Let me say this. Faith doesn't always 
take the problem away from us. But faith takes us through the problem. Faith does not always remove the pain from us. But faith gives us the ability to handle the pain. Faith doesn't always take the storms away from our lives, but faith calms us in the midst of the storm. That is faith. That's why Corinne Ten Boone, she says, faith is like the radar that sees through the fog. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Faith is the radar that sees through the fog. Even though I could not understand, even though I could not see, you know, the, the picture clearly, even though I'm struggling, but yet I have faith in God. That is faith at all times, no matter what. You remember Job in the Old Testament? Job suffered greatly. He experienced tremendous pain. Loss of family, loss of wealth, his business, and also his health is being, was greatly affected. None of us want to experience what Job experienced. But Job, as you remember, he struggled tremendously. He has a lot of questions, but ultimately the Bible says he trusted the Lord. He continues to trust in the Lord in spite of his situation. Even though he could not understand why he has to go through what he went through, he put his faith, his trust in the Lord. When God appears to, to Job, what did God say to him? What did God say? Did God say to Job, Job, poor thing. So sorry. You have to go through this uh, mess in your life. But Job, I want you to know it is not my fault. It is all the fault of S. Etan. Okay, he wanted to tempt you. He said, you are a righteous man. He said, no matter what you go through, you still continue to believe in me. And therefore, I have no choice but to allow you to go through what you went through. But Job, I must commend you. You stood firm. You came up strong. Well done. Did God say that to Job? No. God did not even give Job an explanation. For what he went through. God did not answer his questions at all. God did not. But God just in a, a, a thunderous, uh, in a glorious monologue, God revealed himself to Job. And God says to Job, I am the, the Almighty. I am eternal. I am majestic. I am wise, I am perfect, I am sovereign. So God just revealed himself to Job for who he is, that he is God and he is God Almighty. That's why from this simple story, from the life of Job, there's one simple implication. The implication is this. God is God. Job is not and we are not. That's the simple implication. That's why whenever I face with situations that I could not understand, as a pastor, I, I journey with people in pain, in suffering, in death. And many times I could not understand. But when I, I, when I could not understand, when I struggle even myself, I remind myself this, that God is God. And I am not. God is God and I am not. That's the simple implication. In 1975, Jesuit philosopher John Cavanaugh, he went to Calcutta to work in the 
the, the, the home of Mother Teresa. He wanted to spend some time there because he has some spiritual struggles in his life. And he hoped to get some answer during his time at the, the charity. When he was there, the next morning, he met Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa asked him, John, what can I pray for you? And John said to Mother Teresa, well, I have some struggles. I want you to pray for me that I will find clarity. That I will have clarity to some of the issues that I'm struggling. And immediately Mother Teresa laughed, you know. And he said to John, I will not pray that you will get clarity. And John was taken back and John asked Mother Teresa, how come? Because I, I realized that you always have clarity. I see in you, in your work all these years, you always have clarity. And Mother Teresa said to John, John, that was not the case. Actually, I don't have clarity. All I have is trust in the Lord, not clarity. And Mother Teresa said to John, I'll pray for you that you have trust, not clarity. The point is that there are times we could not get the clarity that we want to many issues that we face in life. There are times we just could not understand. Things that could not, we could not make sense, we could not comprehend. That's where trust comes in. That's why I say faith matters when we don't understand. You remember Thomas in the New Testament? We call him Doubting Thomas. In John chapter 20, verses 27 to 29. In verse 27, the Bible says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see here? Thomas wanted to see, then he believed. Because he wanted clarity in one sense. But here Jesus saying to him, because you have seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who have not seen, no clarity, but yet still believe. Blessed are them. This is not blind faith. This is bold faith in God. That's why we declare no matter what, under whatever circumstances, God is still God. And God is still a good God. And God is in control and God is sovereign even though we don't understand and therefore we continue to place our faith in Him. That's why church, faith matters. Maybe some of you here this morning, you are struggling with a certain situation and your faith is being challenged. You have your questions, you have your doubts. But this morning, God is saying to you, no matter what, He is still God. And He's sovereign over your life. And He loves you. And God is saying to us, look to Him. And we put our trust in Him, even though we do not understand. So church, faith matters. Secondly, what matters is foundation matters. Foundation matters. Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. The word understanding means what we understand or our comprehension, our insight. That is our understanding. So the question is, where do you get your understanding? Where do you get your understanding? You remember the last time I preached here, I did mention that uh, there are a few sources that we get our understanding. Let me repeat that again. There are a few sources really as to where we get our understanding. Basically, maybe let just there are at least maybe five sources, five Gs. All right. First, we get our understanding from experienced people. Especially people who are older than us, who are even more sought than rise than us, you know, we 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 glean from their experience and we get our understanding from them. So the first G is, uh, you know, we get our understanding from our grandfather. All right, our grandfathers, older, wiser, we get our understanding from them. Second, we get our understanding from our teachers, all right, our professors, uh, learned people. So second G is guru. The word guru means teacher. So we get our understanding from, uh, from our teachers, you know, people who have more, more, more knowledgeable than us. We, we get understanding from them. Second G. Third G, you know, la, from Google law. <laughs> Now every time we don't, we want to know more about something. We Google everything. We Google, and we get lots of understanding from Google, right? Thank God for Google. But just remember, not everything Google says is right. Huh? <laughs> All right. The source, fourth source is the first worst source uh, from gossiper. Uh. <laughs> People who you know get. So- Understand from somewhere, a little here, little there, and they pass on, and they pass on, and they say, this is, this is good, you know. When you're sick, you must take this, you must drink this, you must eat this, and whatnot, all right? They mean well, but, you know, their understanding is not based on right foundation, so to speak. But the fifth source is the most important, is God's Word. We must get our understanding from the divine, divine Word of God. And that is so important that God's word must be the source of our understanding. That's where we get our comprehension, our insight, so to speak. Let me ask you two questions right now. Through what lens do you see the world? Through what lens do you see the world? And second question is, with what, les- with what lenses do you, you know, uh, examine uh, the understanding of your circumstances? That means with what lenses do you examine what you're going through in your life? You see, all of us, we look at things through Certain lenses that we have, all of us, certain lenses. But as Christians, it is important that we look at life through the lens, through the lens of the Scripture, through the lens of the the, the Bible, so to speak. And it's so important because the Bible is God's, is, is an open lens for us to understand God's viewpoint about life. And therefore, by filtering our circumstances through the the lenses of the Scripture, we're able to gain a broader perspective of things. And most of all, we gain an eternal perspective. That's why you and I, we must learn to look at life, look at situations, look at what we are going through, through the lens of the Scripture. That's why Dan Ritland, he says, Our perception, the filter through which we see everything, has a tremendous effect 
on our lives. It is true. How you view certain situation, how you see your life has great implications and effects on you because we all make our decisions, our judgment, our assessment through our understanding. So therefore, the source of your understanding will determine how you view life. And therefore, it is so, so important that we as, Christ, as Christians, we view life through the divine lenses of the Word of God. That's why in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says, My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Here you see, God is saying to all of us, we must keep, we must store the Word of God in us. Let that, let that be the source, the foundation of our understanding. From these few verses, there are three challenges for all of us. Three very important challenges. Number one, that we are to see life through the lens of Scripture. That you and I were able to look at life through the lens of Scripture. In other words, what is God saying about this situation, that situation, what is happening, what is God saying to us? What does the Bible has to say to us? That is the number one challenge. See life through the lens of Scripture because sometimes we all, we see life through our narrow, you know, lens, through our, you know, biased lenses. And therefore, we look at life very differently. Some people, they look at life through the lens of their pain the lens of the, the past, the lens of, of the hurts they experience in life. And therefore, the, the outcome of their perspective is very different then. So that's our challenge. See life through the lens of Scripture. Number two, saturate our hearts and mind with Scripture. We must store the Word of God in us. Only then, we're able to draw from God's Word as we face life challenges. The Word of God becomes our foundation, so to speak. And that's so important. But when you are weak with the Word of God, then your tendency is to view life through your own lenses. But the Word of God will keep our hearts strong will direct our steps, help us in our decision-making, help us in our assessment and our judgment. So we got to saturate. That's why the, I want to encourage you, always take time to dig deeper into the Word of God. Don't just rely on the taking of the Word of God just based on a Sunday morning sermon alone. That is not enough. Just like it's not enough just to eat on Sunday. We eat every day. In the same way with the Word of God, we must dig deeper, understand God's Word, and store God's Word in our hearts. Third challenge, sort out current situation according to Scripture. What is happening to your life right now? What are you facing right now? And you've got to ask yourself, what is the Word of God? has to say about what I'm experiencing right now. And that is important. You receive guidance from God's divine word and you allow God's word to, to direct your steps. So these are the three challenges that confront all of us here. See life through the lens of scripture, saturate our hearts and mind with scripture, and sort out current situation according to Scripture. Again, back to the story of Job. You remember all his friends? 
All his friends meant well. Really. They wanted to help Job. But sadly, they were looking at Job's situation through their own lenses. Not through the divine you know, lenses of God, but through their own lenses. Should they give all kinds of counsel, but wrong counsel to Job? That's what happened when we view life through our own human lenses. So the Lord has to help us. That's why the important question that we must always ask is, what does the Bible has to say? What does the Bible say about this issue or that issue? That's ultimately the most important answer. What does the Bible have to say about marriage, for example? Today, there are culture or people who try to redefine marriage. But for us as Christians, ultimately is, what does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about death, about money? about trials, about life. You know, we got to go back to the scripture and ultimately the question is, what does the Bible has to say? And that's where it will give us our understanding. That's where we'll get our right perspective of the different issues in life. So church, this is so, so important that we build a strong foundation. And I pray that your foundation is built on the Word of God. That you will not lean on your own understanding, but your understanding is based on the Scripture, the Bible. Let me tell you a story. A story about a farmer who has a horse and a son. One day, the horse ran away. And all the neighbors came by. And the neighbors said to the farmer, Oh, poor farmer, poor thing. We feel so sad for you. You have only one horse. And your horse ran away. And the farmer came out. And the farmer says, Well, could be good, could be bad. Don't know yet. The next day, the horse came back with another horse. That means the farmer's horse must be female. <laughs> came back with another horse. And the neighbors came out and they said to the farmer, Wow, you are so lucky, so blessed. Your horse ran away and now came back with another horse. The next day, the son played with the horse and the horse kicked the son's leg and his leg was broken. And the neighbors came by and they said to him, Wow, poor thing. So sad. You have only one son. And now his leg is broken. The farmer came out and he said, Well, could be good, could be bad. Don't know yet. The next day, war broke out. And the army you know, came to enlist all the young, young people into to, to serve in, in the battlefield. And when they came to the farmer's house, realized the son's leg was broken, and therefore he was exempted from joining the army. And the farm and the neighbors came out and they all said to the farmer, Wow, you are so, so blessed, you know. Uh, our sons are now in the battlefield and they may die and they may not come back, but your son is with you and you are so, so fortunate. Of course, the farmer came out and he said, well, could be good, could be bad, don't know yet. What's the point? It is true that in life situation, you know, it could turn out good, it could turn out bad, but we don't know. Why don't you know this? For the neighbors that look at the, the situation that took place in the farmer's life from the lens of pessimism, they are always negative, all right? They look at things from the lens of pessimism. 
But from the farmer, he looks at his situation from the lens of probability. Could be good, could be bad. But we as people of God, we must always tend to look at situation from the lens of promise. The promises of the word of God. That is what is needful. That we look at life, our situation, through the lens of God's promises. Romans 8, 28. All things work out for good to those who love Him and call according to His purpose. All things will work out for good. So for us as believers, it's not just could be good, could be bad, but rather we say it will be good. Amen. Amen. It will be good because God is sovereign and God is in control and believe that, we believe that all things will work out for good. And we stand on the foundation of God's word. We stand on the promises of God's word. And we continue to put our faith in the Lord. When we have the right foundation, it will help us to face life's challenges. That's why I say, church, foundation matters. So the point is, what are you building your life on? What is your foundation? I pray your foundation will be the Word of God because foundation matters. You remember the, the story of the two builders in the New Testament? Two built houses. But when the storms of life came, one house could not stand firm. But the other that built on the rock stood firm. The one that built on sand crumble, collapse. But the one that built on the rock remains steadfast and strong because of the foundation. One builds on sand, one builds on rock. I pray that your life and my life, our foundation will be on the rock. God's word and the Lord Jesus Christ be our very foundation. That's why church, foundation matters. So faith matters, foundation matters, and thirdly, fundamental matters. Fundamental matters. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. The word found, fundamental means things of central importance. Central importance. So what is the central importance in our lives? The central importance is our relationship with God. Your relationship with God, your walk with God is of central importance. As you know, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. And therefore, the central importance is your relationship with God. It's about how you know God. How strong is your walk, your relationship with God. In Jeremiah chapter 9, in verses 23 and 24. In verse 23, the Bible says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise both of their wisdom, or the strong both of their strength, or the rich both of their riches. But let the one who boasts, boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me. That they have the understanding to know me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in this I delight, declares the Lord. So what is the one thing we should all be boasting? We should boast of the fact that we know God. That we know Him. That is most important, church. Because when you know your God, then whatever you face, 
you face that challenge with a greater sense of confidence and assurance because you know that your God is with you. You can say, my God will help me. That's why Paul said, my God shall supply all my needs. My God. It's not your God, but my God. It's very personal that what is important is not just about knowing about God, but knowing God. Many Christians today, they have a lot of knowledge about God, but they do not know God personally because they fail to experience nor encounter God in their lives. And therefore, that relationship with God is not strong, it's not close, it's not intimate because they know more about God than knowing God. So the challenge for all of us in our walk with the Lord is to know God more personally. Know that He is your Savior, first of all. That He died for you. He came down from heaven to redeem us, to restore us. We thank God for the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So know that He is your Savior and also know that He is your shepherd. That He will lead you and He will guide you. That God is your Savior and God is your shepherd. In my own life, in the ministry, in all these years, I experience you know, the goodness of the, how the Lord has led me step by step. And therefore, because I experience my shepherd, and I have that faith and confidence and assurance that no matter what situation I'm in, the Lord is with me. Because the Lord is my shepherd. That's why Psalmist David say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or I shall not lack. And he say, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And some day we continue on. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. That shows how much, how much Samish David knows his God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Wow. And of course, lastly, at the end in verse 6, David says, Surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, surely. That shows how much he knows his God. You know, David went through ups and downs, great challenges, because, but because he knows his God, he persevered on, he pressed on, he did not give in, he did not give up. He continues to put his faith in God. God is your Savior, God is your Shepherd, and God is our strength. When we face with challenging, challenging situations, He will strengthen us. He will be our strength to help us to face every mountain and every valley. He will be our strength. So fundamental matters. I pray that you grow to know God more and more personally not just theoretically, not just in your mind, but in your heart. Let me just close with this story. One day, a six-year-old son asked the father, Father, how big is God? Father, what is the size of God? As they were, work, as they were walking at that point, an aircraft flew over them. And the father Ask the son, son, look up to, to the sky. Could you see the aircraft? Let me ask you, how big is the aircraft? And the son says, Dad, it is so small. The aircraft is so small. Then the father took the son to the airport, parked the car, 
and then walk into the terminal and walk, walk straight to, to where the, the aircrafts are being parked. As they got nearer to the aircrafts, the father says to the son, son, look at the aircrafts. And let me ask you, how big is the aircraft? And the son says, dad, it is so big. The aircraft is so big. What's the point? The point is this. The nearer you are to God, you are able to see the bigness of your God and the greatness of your God. But the further you are away from God, you could not see the greatness and the bigness of your God. When you're far away from God, then you tend to look at things through your own human lenses. But when you're near to God, you're able to look at God through the biblical lenses. That's why it is so needful for us to be near God. In His presence, there is fullness of joy. In His presence, there is liberty. In His presence, there is freedom. In His presence, there is healing. We need to be in His presence. That's why Jesus says, Come to me, all those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. That's what we need to do. We need to go into the presence of our God. Yes, from time to time, there are situations we could not fully understand. But remember, faith matters. Foundation matters. And fundamental matters. Let us pray.